Man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Welcome back, everyone. We are going to be taking a look back at how it is they hid the Father and the Beloved Son in plain sight after the resurrection, when Christianity became legal. This is something that is going to be quite the journey, and it will reveal how they did this, not just before the heliocentric model and Big Bang, but also after. It's an ongoing deception, and it has divided believers since the theory was created in the 4th century. So we're going to be talking about a couple of the most controversial topics in Christianity. So before we get started and dive into this, I want to ask you to pray that the Father will guide your understanding and clear up confusion. Don't trust the things that I say. Lean on the Holy Spirit to guide you in your understandings. This is the only way to be set free from some of the lies that have been deep-rooted into our minds and our hearts. And this is why it's important to stay humble and let the anger that you have be set aside while you look at the evidence that we are going to show you. Because these two topics, especially the first one I'm going to reveal to you, the grace versus law aspect, is one that definitely creates some anger, including anger from me. I have had a lot of anger when researching this, debating this, talking to people about this. I understand where both sides are coming from now. It's quite different than I thought. We all have our preconceived notions and stereotypes, but this is one of them, and it is interrelated with the other, perhaps more controversial topic of the Trinity. I'm going to definitely get some heat on this, and that's fine. I know that there are lots of great, honest, good-hearted people who believe both ways on this topic, and I am fine with you believing what you believe as long as the Holy Spirit's revealing it to you to be true, not man, not any creed or teachings that have gone before us that go against the words of the Messiah. And this is one of those topics that I've sort of put off and struggled with for the fact that I like making everybody happy on both sides. I hate drama. So it's tough to speak about certain things like this, but I am blessed to have seen some of the things I've seen. And again, don't put your trust in me. Pray hard about this. Humble yourself because these two topics are related very closely. And the reason I say that, the grace versus law aspect, is because I've had something really change the way I look at this argument and this debate for the past few months now. And one of those things is who the greatest in the kingdom of heaven are versus who the least in the kingdom of heaven are. And it's all based on the words of the Messiah, because they have asked him, the disciples, they said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? This is something they were curious about because they wanted to know, how do we need to live? What do we need to be doing to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And the Messiah answered plainly, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That's a big deal. He's telling us the importance of being humble. And I believe it's significant that he used a small child because little children, they look up to their parents. They are moldable. You can shape their minds very easily. That's why the enemy likes to deceive the little ones first because they look up to adults. They look up to their teachers, to their parents. They want to please their fathers and mothers and honor them and impress them. So these little children, they are humble. They look at you as someone who knows everything, who has all the answers. I can remember looking to my dad and just thinking, this guy knows everything. I would ask him all these questions. We need to be doing that as well to our Heavenly Father, looking up to him, knowing that he knows way more than we do. He knows what's good for us. That's why he's given us guidelines. And so the humble ones are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and the least in the kingdom of heaven, because there's a hierarchy, it seems, when you listen to the words of the Messiah. Is something that he talked about before, back in Matthew chapter 5, when he was saying the same exact phrase, 
Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So we literally have a ranking system of the least, the great, and the greatest, with the greatest being the humble ones and the least being those who are false teachers telling people to partake in lawlessness, to go out and break the Father's commands. And if you noticed, he said, Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments, well, looking at it from an adversarial standpoint, wouldn't they want to go after the first of all commandments? And that first of all commandments, according to the Messiah, was to hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And where the enemy starts to show himself the most is when you listen to the first Jesuit pope tell us that each creature testifies that God is three. That's a big deal. It may not seem like it. It may seem innocent, but we're going to be looking at where that lie came from because the Messiah is right, the Pope is a liar, and when you go back to where this quote came from, the first of all commandments, he is speaking of the one that is followed up with, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Maybe that's why the unclean spirits are at work, to get you to receive a mark in your right hand or in your forehead. A lot of people talk about the mark of the beast. They try to pervert the truth and mimic what the Father has done their own way to be against him and show you that they are against him. And so the first of all commandments, of course, that is one they're going to go after, but it is a history lesson. And so this is going to be broken down into three parts. The first is going to be the history of the Babylonian trinities, Egyptian trinities, the creeds, the persecution, and other ancient trinities. The second will be the Father and the Son before the resurrection, and then we'll end by looking at the Father and the Son after the resurrection. Three parts. I'm going to try to keep this all in one video because it's extremely important, and I don't want to be flooded with a lot of questions. I want to be able to answer them all here. So the history is a big deal because you have a lot of things in the Word that won't make a lot of sense until you understand the history. And fortunately, we have accounts that show us why Tammuz was mentioned in Ezekiel, what part of a trinity was he a part of, the one with Nimrod and his mother Semiramis. A lot of these ancient trinities were created for a purpose. And now that we have seen them become mainstream in regards to the Messiah, thanks to the creeds and things that followed the resurrection. They have deceived a lot of people into thinking that the Messiah never came and that he was just a copy and paste of these trinities, when in reality, the enemies of truth were desperate. And you see that when you look at the timeline. The resurrection happened around 33 AD, and you have Christianity being extremely persecuted. This message had to be stopped. They were not just going to lay back and let it happen. And so they were doing everything they could. They were forcing Christians to sacrifice to Roman gods or face execution, and they weren't phased. And of course, if you can imagine being an onlooker and seeing someone take something to their death, you have to think, there must be truth to this. If they're willing to die for it, it's not some fairy tale. And the word began to spread, prophecies began to be fulfilled, and the few hundred years that passed was enough to give them time to make some plans. These unclean spirits weren't just going to let it happen, and if you can't beat them, what are you going to do? You're going to join them. So Christianity became legal under Constantine in the First Council of Nicaea, where they were condemning Arianism, 
which stated that the father and the son were separate, that there was a father and there was a son, that was condemned. And Yeshua became God the Son and God from God. But this wasn't the only commandment they were going after, the first of all commandments. They later went on to change the Sabbath to Sunday in honor of their sun god worshipers. That was during the Council of Laodicea. And around that same time, you had the old Roman creeds, which became known as the Apostles' Creeds. And eventually, in 400 AD, the same guy who brought us the dates for Easter, Athanasius, who created the Athanasian Creed, was the one that finally says that God is three, just like the Pope is saying. It took a while to get to that, but now it has become part of mainstream quotes that are spoken in church ceremonies where they have to quote these creeds as part of their services. That's a little bit of the history. So let's look at the ancient trinities and go further back in history because the one mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 8 where the father was talking about things that made him angry, one of those was women weeping for Tammuz. Well, who is this Tammuz character? And the answer to that question goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel and Nimrod, the ruler who was very much against the Most High and his wife, Semiramis, recognized shortly after he died that without him, she would lose power herself. And so she devised a clever plan, and that plan was to become pregnant and tell everyone that this son she conceived was Nimrod reincarnated, and that Nimrod had been Helios, and now he's going to come back from his sun god status and yet again rule as Tammuz. And that made her a part of that trinity. So she would be kind of like the Holy Mary, Mother of God type of person, where she is now the mother of a sun god. So that helped her maintain her rule. Eventually, Tammuz would go on to die. People lost their false god, realized he was mortal, and women were weeping for Tammuz. This was something that made the father angry, so you can bet the enemies of truth will try to take that story that Babylonian lie, and merge it with their own. And I personally think that these Babylonian lies were linked up with the ancient Egyptian lies. And I think that's why when you look at Tammuz here, he looks a lot like Horus. Same exact pose, got his little crosses, the crosses that look a lot like the ones you see on the oldest church in D.C. It's a Roman Catholic church, believe it or not, and this church is called the Holy Trinity. A Jesuit founded this church. Just like our Pope is a Jesuit, these people are devout. And if you read their oaths that they have taken, it's a dark path when you read that. When you see the things that they are willing to do to us, it's morbid. And somehow they are allowed into the highest positions of power throughout all of our governments around the world. And they are the ones, of course, like we said before, who invented the Big Bang. But there are more ancient trinities and the reason they were able to spread from Babylon to Egypt is because of the borders here. The Babylonian Empire was right next to the Kingdom of Egypt when they were expanding, and so those customs just easily jumped the border there. And when you look at other ancient trinities, this is the last one we're going to look at. You see this one here from the Hindu Bible from more than 3,000 years ago, and it contains the following passage, and it says, O ye three lords, Know that I recognize only one God. Inform me, therefore, which of you is the true divinity, that I may address him alone, my adorations. The three gods, becoming manifest to him, replied, Learn, O devotee, that there is no real distinction between us. What to you appears such is only the semblance. The single being appears under three forms, by the acts of creation, preservation, and destruction, but he is one. Interesting that it says he, because I thought this was two women and then a dude with many heads. <laughs> but uh, allegedly, that's uh, three guys, maybe? I don't know. Or they are confused. They started the whole gender identity crisis way back when. Um, but those are some ancient trinities. And now we're going to look at the Father and the Son before the resurrection and show you some mind-blowing things that I've seen recently. This is some new stuff that I had yet to see until the other day when I was diving into this and trying to figure out what else is missing because it feels like something was missing. And this takes us back to the words the Messiah said 
that made the high priest angry because they were questioning him before the crucifixion and what he said when they asked him if he was the son of God. He said, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Well, the priest got really angry. It says the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold now, ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? So they are mocking him. They are angry. Why would they be so angry at him saying this? What was he really saying? What did they know about that would have made them angry? I'm not sure, but one thing that I saw when I looked at other translations of this, that he might not have said, sitting at the right hand of power. He might have said, sitting at the right hand of the power of God, or the right hand of God, according to some translations I've looked at. And one of them is from the Hebrew Matthew, which says, I say to you, you have yet to see the Son of God sitting at the right hand of the power of God, coming on the clouds of heaven. So that's a father and son reference that would have made them extremely angry. But where did that reference come from? Because I had no clue there was a connection to Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel's having visions, and he says, I kept watching the night visions when I saw, coming with the clouds of heaven, someone like a son of man. He approached the Ancient One and was led into his presence. To him was given rulership, glory, and a kingdom, so that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His rulership is an eternal rulership that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's from Daniel. I'm not going to say there's a connection there. I'll let you figure that out on your own. I haven't gone much deeper in it than just looking at it in its original translation, seeing what that means, reading further on. I could be taking this out of context. You all are teachers as well. You, Some of you may have studied this long before I've even brought this up. So I thank you for that. We are iron sharpening iron, and that is why I'm blessed to have you sent this direction. But uh, that was a connection that I hadn't seen, and it's important to look at because that may be why the high priest were angry. Him saying that he is fulfilling a prophecy, and they are trying to find anything they can to put him to death, and that was their reason. Him saying he's the Son of God. But this all took place right before the crucifixion and the resurrection, and it's important that we go back to the beginning of his chapter, where they are quoting other prophecies, other prophecies being fulfilled. One of those was a prophecy on Micah, where it says in Matthew chapter 2, And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. I had to go back and look up what prophecy this was because it doesn't say this prophet Micah. It just says it is written by the prophet. So I went back, found the prophecy, and this prophecy says nearly the exact same thing. But thou Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And I believe a more accurate translation of that word is ancient times, because you look at what that word originally meant, that's what it meant. And so I have another verse up here, another translation stating that, and it really does give us a good look at those prophecies unfolding, just like the one where the father says, out of Egypt have I called my son, telling us who he was before it happened. And then you have in the book of Luke, I like this story, where the parents are going to celebrate Passover and they are taking their little son with them, the little Messiah, little Yeshua, and he goes off and does his own thing and is speaking in the temple, but his parents don't know about it. And it says, I'm going to read this because this is uh, something I don't want to mess up. It says, And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, 
went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, imagine that, three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Which ye not that I must be about my father's business? <laughs> so they were perplexed. They're like, what are you talking about, about your father's business? They really didn't fully understand what he was speaking of. He knew what he was talking about, and he was doing his father's business. He did his father's will perfectly. That is why when we look forward, you see the father telling us, this is my beloved son. He only speaks twice in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and what he said was important. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The second time he said that, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So he added to it by telling us to listen. So imagine you're there. You're at this baptism. You're seeing this happen. You hear this voice telling you this is my beloved son. That's what you need to believe. You don't need to believe what people say after that point. You need to believe what the Father is telling you. And also see if it lines up with what the Messiah is telling you, the disciples, and all of the other witnesses you have, because there are several witnesses in the New Testament that tell you that he is the Son of the Most High. So you've got the Father saying it. What does Yeshua say? We're going to look deeper at that. We're going to see what the disciples say. But even the devil and the demons called him the Son of God. The creeds, of course, that's a different witness. They say that he is God. But let's look at what the Messiah himself says, because he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. I used to read that and think he was talking about Peter, but he's not. He's talking about the answer to the question he asked. The answer to that question was that he is the Son of God, and he says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Sheol shall not prevail against it. That is powerful. He is telling us who he is and what rock he will found his church on, and that is extremely significant because the enemy would love to create a church that is not founded on that rock. And that is why Rome has leaked into most of Christianity. They leave the other religions alone, and this one is where they go after it the most. You have thousands of denominations, and most of them don't really have this rock as their foundation. And I know some of you watching this are probably crawling out of your skin angry if you if you have never seen this. And again, I understand. I know where you're coming from. I have dealt with many. This is not a new topic for me. It's just that I've put off talking about it for so long. But we're going to look at the will of the Son versus the will of the Father because He taught us how to pray. This is where I first got my look into this topic because when I was a newborn believer back in my teens, I think around 16 or 17, I was going around people for the first time who were praying out loud, and I heard them praying different ways. I heard some people praying to the Father. I heard some people praying to the Messiah. I was confused. I wanted to get this right. 
So instead of asking a preacher or someone, I just prayed. I said, Father, how am I supposed to pray? Because I hear some people praying to your son, some people praying to you. And that brought me back to the example that his son gave us. And that is we are to pray to our father. It's that simple. We are to pray just like he did because he gave us an example praying to his father. He says, not my will, but yours be done. Living out the example he gave us because when you look at it right here, he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And here he is doing what he told us to do. And that shows us that we have two separate wills but we also have two separate sets of foreknowledge because the Messiah, he knows a lot. He has seen and heard and learned from the Father, but he tells us about the end when he's talking to the disciples about the end. He says, but when that day and hour will come, no one knows, not the angels in heaven, not the Son, only the Father. So that is showing us that there's not only a separate will, but there's also foreknowledge that the Father has, and a lot of us, we want to act as if we know the end and the times and the dates, but that is the Father's business. That is what he knows. My dad told me this. He said, you know, it's the Father's business. He said, I kept trying to figure out a date and do all these things, but only the Father knows. Yeshua didn't even know. And so to say that I know, I have my suspicions, but to say that I know anything would mean that I know more than the Messiah, and I don't. Now, I could go through and make this video many hours long before I look at what happened after the resurrection in our final chapter, but again, I trust that you guys will do your research and compile everything, pray about this, let the Spirit guide you, because we don't really need another teacher. The Spirit's here to guide us for a reason, and it's not in vain. It's so that we can see the truth and the lies of this world be exposed. But before we look at the things that happened after the resurrection, I want to look at a vision that Ezra saw. This was from the fourth book of Ezra, or two Ezras that used to be in the King James Version, where you have him seeing exactly what is played out in Revelation, where it says, Ezra saw upon Mount Zion a great people whom I could not number, and they all praised Yahuwah with songs. And in the midst of them there was a young man of high stature, taller than all the rest, and upon every one of their heads he set crowns and was more exalted, which I marveled at greatly. So I asked the angel, and said, Sir, what are these? He answered and said unto me, These be they that have put off the mortal clothing, and put on the immortal, and have confessed the name of Elohim. Now are they crowned, and receive palms. Then I said unto the angel, What young person is it that crowns them, and gives them palms in their hands? So he answered and said unto me, It is the son of Elohim, whom they have confessed in the world. Then I began greatly to commend them that stood so stiffly for the name of Yahuwah. Then the angel said unto me, Go your way and tell my people what manner of things and how great wonders of Yahuwah Eloheka you have seen. That was beautiful, but let's look at Revelation chapter 7 and see how much it matches up. This is now after the resurrection. You're having these prophecies laid out and they look exactly like Ezra's vision. For example, it says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb. They weren't asking who this was. They knew. <laughs> they knew because he had already resurrected. This is no longer the same type of vision where you're seeing something that's a mystery. They knew who the Lamb was. And it says, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, just like we saw earlier, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God. So just exactly like that vision. And I know that seeing them both in real life is going to be more spectacular but before we go into more of the end time stuff, let's look at right after the resurrection. And this takes us back to right after the resurrection when you have Mary inside the tomb. She's weeping. She's sad. And these two angels appear. One at the head of where they left the Messiah's body before and one at the feet. And so she is extremely sad. And when they ask her why she's crying, she says, it's because they have taken away my Lord. She feels like they've just taken his body away. They've probably hidden it. 
I'm assuming she is not really believing in that resurrection. And so as she's doing this, she turns around and she sees him standing there, the Messiah. And she didn't know it was him right away. And so he says unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. One of the most important witnesses here telling us that the Most High is his father and his God. That is powerful. That is truth. And the people after this that were teaching this truth, Stephen here in the book of Acts, being stoned to death for saying just that, he looked up. It says, look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What did those words do? They covered their ears. You, you picture a little kid doing a little temper tantrum. They covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. If you don't know who that is, that's eventually the one that would become known as Paul. So they laid those down. He witnessed this. He was persecuting this, this type of belief system. He eventually had his eyes open to the truth. But before that, he was angry at people saying that this was for sure the Son of the Most High. And what the Messiah tells us will happen. This is to come. I talk about after the resurrection. This is after our resurrection, where he says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Again, he's saying, my God. And if he is the Most High, who is the God of the Most High? You might want to find that out, because that would be really important. However, this is just the beloved Son telling us that he will make us a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. So this name debate that's going on, he's going to give us his new name, and thankfully that debate will be over there's going to be a lot more clarity restored. This is one of the final things to happen, but it's not the end. We're going to look at what happens a little further, where he says, I will let him who wins the victory sit with me on my throne, just as I myself also won the victory and sat down with my father on his throne. Those who have ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. You have to listen to what the Spirit's saying. That is key to this entire debate. Listen to the Spirit, not me, not the creeds, not anyone else, to the Spirit. And that is, again, getting closer to the final transfer of authority. I'm not there yet. But 1 Corinthians brings us there where it says, For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that Yahuwah may be all in all. This final part of our chapter where the Son subjects himself unto the Father is one that will settle everything. I just want it to be made more clear before that happens because it will impact your life greatly. The way you pray, the way you see the Father's grace, just like the truth of creation has brought us closer to our Creator, I ask that this does the same. I know it's tough, especially if you're new to this this topic and have never looked into this or dove deep into the history of it. It goes even deeper. This is one of our longest videos that we've done, but it's worth it because there's so many things that will fall into place, just like the truth about creation. And there will be all of these proofs that you see that seem to prove otherwise. Investigate them, just like you did with the truth about creation. Look into them further, and you will start to see things similar to the grace versus law debate, which I always looked at it as one versus the other. However, as I have dug into this topic, I am seeing that the grace versus law has never been a thing. 
It's always been both. His mercy endures forever. That's not a new message. When I went through and started compiling verses, I saw that it was throughout the entire Old Testament. We just couldn't see it because people had yet to have that example that we have to live by, and the enemies of truth have tried to hide that example and hide the truth of who the beloved son is and corrupt that image. That's the one they focus on the most. And Christianity has like 45,000 different denominations or whatever the exact number is, I can't remember, for a reason. Because divide and conquer is the goal. And although this topic will divide, I really do ask that you pray for truth because it will set you free in a different way, similar to the truth, like I said, about creation does. It will help you pray the right way, and that is why I originally asked the Father to show me this. I had no clue that it would lead to what I have seen and what I continually see, and, and I'm just shown so many different things, and you guys have helped with that. So I thank you for your understanding, being humble enough to listen, because the ones that are humble will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven for a reason. They are the ones that put the Father first and love Him with all their heart. And it lines up exactly with the first of all commandments. To hear that the Father is one and to love Him with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your might. Remind yourself of this. It's important, and people have lost sight of it, and it's caused our Father a lot of long-suffering. And so, remember... Stay humble. I'm going to go ahead and let you guys do your own research. I could keep going forever about this. I'm passionate about this topic because it brings glory to our Father and to the Father of the beloved Son who did something that was extremely powerful, something that I couldn't do, and that is say, Thy will be done at a time when He could have easily turned the other way and taken the world, which was in fact offered to Him but he chose to do it for you, and the Father the same chose to send his Son for you, and it was not easy for him to endure what he did, but it has to do with his grace and his mercy. So I love you guys. The Father loves you. You are beloved creations of the Most High. Spread the truth no matter what the cost, and stay humble.